Let's take our Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 3, turn there, and uh, we'll do our prayer request and have our prayer time here shortly, and appreciate everybody making the effort to come out tonight, and uh, it's just good to be in God's house, God's people, amen? So be thinking about some things that you want to pray about, and some people that you want to pray for, and things that you want to lift up to the Lord uh, I know we're going to, uh, Brother Roy uh, had to have another one of his treatments and they put some medicine in here behind his eyes and it takes that, there's a lot of fluid that builds up back there. Excuse me, so uh, he's had that done today and uh, so he's not a whole lot he can see right now, so just pray for him. Uh, Sister Pam called me the other day and uh, said that uh, she thinks that She's been uh, taking a vitamin or something like that that's like overdoing it in her, and it's making her feel bad, making her feel sick. And um, so anyway, she was uh, hoping to get back on her feet, so just pray for her, and she's having a hard time of it, and, and just probably just other people we'll talk about here in a little bit, all right? But let's go to the Lord in prayer, and... and uh, Let's try to reach heaven tonight and ask heaven to come reach down and touch us and open up our eyes and our ears and our understanding as we get into God's Word. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for your kindness that you have shown to me and the kindness, Lord, you've shown to the people in this church. Thank you, Lord, for a beautiful day uh, to get out and get about and get moving again. And Lord, we're coming out of our hibernation and and ready to, eager to do something, eager to serve you, eager to, uh, to fellowship with our brothers and our sisters. And Lord, just be there for them and pray for one another. Lord, we're eager to come into this place and study your word tonight. I pray, dear God, that you would just open up your hand to us tonight and feed us well. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you have given us throughout this week. We thank you, Lord, for the work, the labor that you have given to us to do. We ask you, Heavenly Father, Lord God, that you would give us some rest tonight as we open up your word and study it. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just visit with each and every person, Lord, who's listening in tonight, those sitting here, those watching on the internet. And Father, that we could be a blessing to them. And Lord, you would be a blessing to us through your word. Teach us, Lord, some things that we need to know. Help us, dear God, and establish Good, sound Bible principles, Bible doctrine in us, Lord. These are the things, Lord, that make us who we are. And so, Father, I, we pray, dear God, that you would just uh, anoint your word. And, God, that you would just bless it as it goes forth uh, from my mouth into the hearts of these people. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would teach on the inside, Lord, what it is that I try to teach on the outside. Pray, Lord, to be a double witness, Lord, in somebody's soul. Lord, maybe somebody is... Uh, struggling with an issue, Lord, that they're not sure about. And they need help from heaven. Maybe, Lord, somebody tonight, Lord, I have nobody in mind, you know that, but Lord, maybe somebody tonight is struggling, Lord, with compromise. And Lord, maybe they feel like maybe it would be okay to do something, and it's not okay. And I just pray, God, that you would just uh, help them with those issues, Lord. That's what's in my mind tonight from from your word, and I pray, dear God, that you would direct us, Lord, in each and everything in our lives, that we would learn to put things in the right place. Father, we would learn in these days, especially in these last days, to never compromise, never bend, never, never give up, Lord, the things that you have given to us, and these wonderful, wonderful, precious things in your word, Father, help us to never turn to the right or to the left from them, Father, but just stay straight on. Father, just bless us tonight. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. Open up your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. First Peter chapter 3, and um, I want to, uh, I touched on this last Wednesday night about being of one mind. Let, let's just read verse 8 on down. Uh, through probably, oh, we'll go probably to verse 17, and then we'll stop there and we'll back up a little bit. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Finally be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren. Be pitiful and be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing 
that you are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. Verse 10, for he that will love life. And I want you to think about that. I don't know if that characterizes you in general. Do you, for the most part, do you love life? Do you love life? Um, do you, now, sometimes you ask people that and you're not going to get the positive answer. Because sometimes it's hard. But ask the question, do, do I love life? Do I love the life that God has chosen for me to live? And I want you to think about that, because I believe, I mean, of course God gives us a choice, He gives us free will. But I also believe God's sovereignty, and they're not contradictory to one another. And if you stop and think about it, when you yield yourself over to the Lord and say, God, I'm going to live for you, then you're letting God make those choices of life, of how you live. And how you live determines how you're going to see the life that you're living, whether that's going to be good or whether that's going to be bad. You're always going to run into those people who have the sorriest outlook of life of anybody that you know. They are just, it's like they are that way and you can't smile it out of them. You ever know, do you know somebody like that? Somebody who is just constantly negative, constantly down, constantly this and constantly that, and nothing ever, I know a preacher, okay? I know a preacher. And, I mean, I've respected him over the years. I've worked with him doing things over the years. I've just known him for a long time. And he believes the Bible and everything like that. But he is one of the most negative preachers I've ever and every time I would talk to him, I'd say, brother, how's it going? I'm just having so much problems in my church. I can't get them to do anything. I mean, it's just, a, I mean, they're just, nobody's showing up. And it's just, and he's kind of one of these that he's in a church for about two, three, four years. And then out looking for another one. And then there for a while. And then out looking for another one. And he's never found, to my, my knowledge, the church that satisfies him. And... Um, I don't, well, anyway, he's just always got something negative to say about what he's doing. And um, is what he's saying true? Probably. Okay? But sometimes it is what you make of it. Okay? And so there's always going to be those people that are always going to just, they're going to drop an anchor wherever they are, and it's going to be a drag no matter what. But... When you surrender to the Lord, when you give everything over to Him, and say, okay, God, here's the reins. That's an old-fashioned term, right? You have to have horses on it. I'll use it, I'll use it this way. Lord, here's my mouse. You click whatever you want me to be at, all right? Okay? When you let God make the clicks and move the mouse, you surrender to that, and you let God make those decisions for you. And I promise you, if you start looking back then, you'll start seeing that God did, in fact, make things a lot easier. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. And it just causes you then to love life. Okay? I heard a lot of preaching over this last weekend. And one of them mentioned Paul and Silas sitting in jail. Sitting in jail. And for all they knew, they was going to be killed. And what were they doing in there? What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. And it made such an impression that when the ground shook and their fetters fell off and all the doors swung open and the jailer, now he's going to kill himself because he's going, they're going to pin me for letting these prisoners loose. Paul jumps to the rescue and says, let me tell you about, let me tell you about why we're singing in there. Let me tell you about who I know. And it just made a difference in that man's life. And so when, where was I on that? Was, that was good stuff. Verse 10, for he that will love life. And just ask the question, do you love life? Okay, do you love life? And again, I'm not trying to paint with rose-colored glasses about how everything is nice and sweet until the Lord comes. It's not that way. But God just gives you something called grace 
to endure this for a while, and then he'll give you rest, he'll give you joy, he'll give you blessings, then you're going to have to endure this for a while, and it kind of repeats itself, but you get used to it, and you know that you're not going to have the best of days sometimes, and you're just going to make the best of it and get through it. Our, our grandparents, who didn't have 25 cents in their pocket, our grandparents, who worked every day they could just to keep those 14 children fed, okay? They had something that we've lost in our generation with everything being automated. They've lost, that we've lost the joy of having our hands full of work and labor. And I learned this as a young man, learning how to paint houses, I learned the satisfaction of looking back to see what your hands did and if you were happy with what you had done, you get a satisfaction out of that. Of course, I want a paycheck too, but I get the satisfaction out of it. And so anyway, that's just a little mini sermon there about let, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his what? His tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Now, you guys know me, I'm 100,000 miles removed away from the name it, claim it, prosperity gospel doctrine. But your mouth can shape your day in very easy ways. You can shape it for bad, you can shape it for good, okay? And it's not magic words that you must say, it's some things that should be said and some things that shouldn't be said. Amen? And that's what he's talking about here. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. And then, look, I always thought this was cute. And I mean that. The very next verse, verse 11, has the word chew in it. Eschew. Now, go look that word up. Somebody look it up. Find out what it means. Okay? But let him eschew evil. Take the evil, chew it up, spit it out, and get rid of it. Amen? Let him eschew evil and do good, and let him seek peace and ensue it. Now, verse 12. This is where we're going to go tonight. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Now, do you love life? Are you in love with life? Because what did Christ come to give us? Life. Okay? They say that it's wrong to judge people on based upon the way they look. But I say that how you present yourself to people deliberately, now some of you can't help some of your looks, I got it, okay? But I've got in my mind these people who walk around, and it's mainly a younger generation, they wear all black, got black fingernails, and, and they've got skulls decorating stuff, And it's all about death and darkness and dragons and castles and gothic stuff. You know the kind I'm talking about, right? Okay? That is, and I'm not, I'm dead serious. That is a death mentality. They love darkness. They love things that are dark. And there is an infatuation with death, dead things, possibly contact with the dead there is that affection there that is where their heart is turned and in case they say you're judging us but you are the one who presented yourself this way this is this is how you chose to walk out of your house today this is your life the music that you listen to is very dark okay no one listens to Marilyn Manson to be put in a good mood okay He doesn't have the top five romance hits, okay? He is a very, he's got this growly, evil voice with those evil sounding instruments and it's done deliberate and there is an infatuation with death on that. Those people, for whatever reason, I I say it's because they're not saved because when God saves you, he puts a spirit of life in you and you're not all about death and doom and gloom anymore. Okay, I, I, that's, I mean, again, people say, well, you're judging by the cover. Change the cover. The cover will reflect what's on the inside, does it not? Okay, 
So, I mean, it's just some things are just common sense. But anyway, when you love life, you understand that the eyes of the Lord are on you at all times. Now, um, I think I mentioned this yesterday. And I may talk about it again tomorrow. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, you know who he is? The guy that owns Facebook. Okay? Had to go talk to Congress. Because, and I, I, maybe Congress is just making a big show out of this. But the truth of it is, Facebook, and it's common knowledge, Facebook was seeded with CIA money. I mean, that's, that's, that's news. That's not conspiracy theory. That is actually what happened. Okay? But there was a catch to this. Because the Central Intelligence Agency realized that they could use something like that to get a glimpse into what people are doing. Were they right? You bet. Absolutely. People share most of their life publicly in a way never done before. And there is a dossier on you. You didn't think you were that important to the, the police state of the government. They've got one on everybody. There is, a, there is a database of records of you that if you knew what was in it, you would want to storm Washington, D.C. Literally everything. And you walk around with this phone, pretend there's a phone in my hand. You walk around with this phone, and you gave Apple and Google and Facebook permission to track your location 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Track your location, and they match records of things that you bought, where you went, what you bought, how much money you did this, and what you did over here. I mean, there's a record of everything that's knowable, just about knowable about you on this earth. There's a record of it in Google servers, and Facebooks, and the CIA, and the NSA, and everything else. But it pales in comparison to what God sees. Pales in comparison to what God sees. Now, the, you read this Bible. Their eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. What that means is, if you are right with God, that doesn't bother you. If you're right with God, you don't have an issue with God seeing everything that goes on in your life, do you? Okay? When we... When we had a school in here, we learned the two different types of students we had. The New Testament students came in, did their work responsibly every day, and if you just walked by and reached over and grabbed one of their paces, they didn't go, what are you doing? I just want to look at your pace. Why? They didn't care. You know why? They didn't have anything to hide. Didn't have anything to cover it up. But the kids that we knew weren't doing things or weren't doing things right, when you start checking them, they, you can tell they, they get nervous. And they don't, why do you got to look over my shoulder all the time? Well, you answer that question. Why do I have to look over your shoulder all the time? Amen? Okay? When you're righteous, you don't have a problem with God keeping His eye on you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, because that's your comfort. And there's something about the eyes of the Lord we're going to get into tonight. But He, he says... Um, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open under their prayers and you don't have a God listening. You don't have a problem with God listening to everything you say. You don't have a problem with God listening to you. You don't have a problem with God watching over you. It's not an issue with you because you've got nothing to hide from him. And your heart's right with God. Okay? But look at the last part of that verse. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Who is it? that when the police ask, can I search your vehicle real quick? And they say, why? It, yeah! There, there's something in that car, okay? Can I search your vehicle, Rick? Yeah, go ahead. It's like when they, at the airport, and they took my bag and they said, sir, we just want to look in your bag here real quick. Yeah, no problem. Then they pulled out that bullet. And I went, <gasps> it's left over from deer season. I forgot about it. Then I started getting scared. 
But I, I, didn't, I didn't figure I had anything to hide. I didn't have anything to worry about. Yeah, go ahead, look in there. I don't care, yeah. And when they pulled it out, I said, you can keep that. I don't want it back. <laughs> so anyway, but that, that's the issue here. Who's watching over you, and do you have a problem with it? Okay? In verse 13, who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Now that verse, we're going to keep it in context here. That verse is not telling you that nobody can harm you. It's not telling you that because you look at the next verse. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. You are going to suffer. But it's better. There's two, two reasons why devils are going to beat you up. Reason A is you did something wrong and God's letting them do it and you got it coming. Reason B is you've done nothing wrong, you're pleasing in the sight of God, and God is letting them do it. And on, the, on this hand here, you're just happier knowing that yes, from time to time you're going to suffer, and yes, from time to time devils are going to walk all over you, and God is allowing it to happen, and you haven't done anything wrong. Your conscience is clear before God, and your heart's right. And you say, okay, devils, do your little dance on me because one of these days, you're under my feet. Okay? Amen. So, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That means on your worst day. When people, when people see you and they know that you are having a rough time of it. And they say to you, I don't see how you hold up during this. You've got an answer. Because you've got hope. Stop and think about it. All the suffering that you've done in this life as of this date, if you didn't have heaven waiting for you at the end, I'd have probably shot myself a long time ago. Dead honest. If I didn't have heaven waiting for me, and I knew it, what then, why then, would I want more bad days? But when you know you've got hope at the end of it, there'll be some more bad days. Come on. Because every bad day that I have from here on out is one day closer to heaven. That's what makes it worth it. Okay? That's the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience. We'll talk about that. Not tonight. We're going to talk about your conscience. That whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ, for it is better. Underline this verse in your Bible. It's verse 17. That number means something. Numbers mean something. I, uh, I'll just give you a little, I, you know that deal on the number 66 I was showing you? Did I show you all that? Okay. I, I expanded that today. I worked on it all day long, and I'm going to start, I'll start it tomorrow for a Watchman broadcast. Okay. This book is, is such order. It'll, it'll stagger you. Okay. And um, anyway, uh, verse 17, for it is better. 17 is number for transformation. Okay? For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. You are going to suffer for two reasons. One's better than the other. Amen? Now, let's go back up to verse 12. It says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. That is a quotation. Turn your Bible to Psalm 34. That's a direct quote from, from the book of Psalms. Chapter 34. Uh, while you're turning there, um, this idea of the eyes of the Lord. Somebody give me a verse or something you know about the Bible about the eyes of the Lord. Okay, they're in every place. Okay, so if, if Finnis Dake said that God doesn't see all the events around the world that he has to send angels out 
to gather the intel and report back to him? If he says that, is he telling the truth? He, has, he believes in a limited God who cannot see everything. That's not my God. If that's his father, we don't, we're not brothers. Because it's not the same dad, amen? Okay. My dad saw everything, okay? But anyway, so the, uh, give, somebody give me another one. The eyes of the Lord. Something in the Bible. The eyes of the Lord. I'll ask, I'll give you, I'll ask you a question. How many of them does he have? We'll get back to that, huh? How many does he have? We'll find out. Psalm 34. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this verse down. You're going to go, oh, yeah. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I want you to think about this for a minute, Okay. Uh, let's say, let's say John and Melissa, okay? John and Melissa, I love you guys, okay? And, and Melissa and the kids are home. John comes walking in the door and she looks at his eyes and she says, you had a bad day. Because you see it in the eyes, don't you? Right? He had a bad day, okay? I won't mess with him like I was going to. I'll lay off of him tonight, Right? Okay? Or the other way around. Okay? When you look in somebody's face, you can tell whether they are for you or against you, can't you? Okay? You can tell. And that, that verse, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, you listen to me. Noah was not afraid to look into the eyes of the Lord because he knew what he would find there. He knew he would find grace you can see it in people's eyes whether they are for you or they are against you you can see it in their eyes and that same thing applies if you're right with god the eyes of the lord do not bother you and you see it in god's eyes you see his love but if you are wicked and you are standing near the wrath of god you don't want to look into god's eyes because you know you're going to see his vengeance his how is it that the Bible described Jesus' eyes in Revelation 19? His eyes were as a what? Flame of fire. He had fire coming out of his eyes. Why? Because now it's the days of vengeance of our God. Okay? And everybody knows it. And they're going, gulp. So, Psalm 34, you there? Say amen. Let's look at uh, verse 12. What man is he that desireth life? See, see that? We just read that, didn't we? Back in, what was it, verse 10, uh, first, uh, yeah, first Peter, verse 10, I, I don't have it up here, but anyway, it's talking about they that love life. And so verse uh, 12, in, what man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? What, what man is he that desireth life? Verse 13, keep thy tongue from evil. And thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good and seek peace and, in, and pursue it. Okay? The, verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. That's what Peter was quoting. He's quoting this whole deal here. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their what? Cry. I'll never forget Reg Kelly Years ago, Alicia, I don't know if you remember this or not, but he had you act this out. He was talking about, the message he was preaching was about crying out unto the Lord. And he had, out of all my daughters, he picked the crying one. And he, he, had, he told her, he said, I want you to cry out like something real bad was happening and you needed daddy's attention. He picked the right one, okay? And so I'll just never forget that as long as I live. But the idea is, and I tell people this, when we have people that have contacted, they've called me and they said, Pastor, you know, I'm sick, I'm, I've got this disease and it, it may end my life. And I've got people telling me that if I had enough faith that I could just speak this. And the reason why I'm dying is that I don't have enough faith and I'm not saying the right words to make this disease go away. I said, it's a lie. They're trying to teach you witchcraft is what they're doing. 
They're trying to tell you that there's magic words with God, that you have to have the magic touch and the magic thoughts behind them. The positive energy must flow out of your words so that God can be unleashed to do these things in you. That is, that's wicked to think that. It's from hell is what it is. Okay? You go through the Psalms and you hear them. I cried unto the Lord. I cried unto the Lord. Okay? What was it that Hagar did with Ishmael? She sat him down and she walked way far away from him out there in the middle of the wilderness. Why? So she couldn't hear him screaming as they died of starvation and thirst. She could not bear to listen to her child cry while they were both going to die in the wilderness. That's big stuff. Who heard them? God did. And the Lord opened, you go back and read that passage, the Lord opened her eyes and there was a well right there. Okay? She couldn't see it until God opened her eyes to it. Amen? And there may be somebody listening, somebody sitting here right now. You're starving, you're so thirsty, you think you're not going to make it. I promise you, there's a well very close to you. When God opens your eyes to it, you'll know it. Okay? I have no idea what that means for you. Don't ask me any more. But that's just, that's what I see and that's what I believe. And so anyway, um, the eyes of the Lord are open, the, uh, open upon the righteous, ears, ears are open under their cry. What I was saying was, go through the Psalms and look at how many times David said, I cried unto the Lord, I cried unto the Lord, I cried out unto the Lord, I, I gave my complaint unto the Lord. You ever complain to God? I have complained, God, I don't, I don't like this. I don't like what's going on. I don't like how things are, and so on and so on. But the idea of crying unto God, it's as simple as Gwenny, when she is having her miserable time, when she cries, she's expressing in the only way that she can that there's a need and she can't take care of it herself. And mama don't have to ask, what are you specifically asking for? Spell it out word for word or I won't be able to do it. Because moms usually just know what each cry is about. Moms just have a way of knowing what that child needs and how they need it and how many times they need it. Parents know that. Parents don't make the children write it out in triplicate. You see what I'm saying? Okay? They just listen for the cry. And, I mean, I, I teach this a lot, and I'll continue to teach it, simply because of the false stuff that's out there. When you're in need, cry. God knows how to fix it. God knows how to address it. God knows how to take care of it. Sometimes God even knows whether you're just putting on or not. Amen? And you really don't need anything. Except for maybe, like my mom would say, I'll give you something to cry about. You want to cry? I'll give you something to cry about. Sometimes that's what I needed. Amen. So, verse 16, The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. To cut them off. Now you, here again, there's two ways of life. There's, there's living life and enjoying life and loving life, and God gives us life, and he will give us the ability to see many days. But then there is the wicked. And God cuts them off, cuts their remembrance off, and it's over with. They're done. Nobody memorializes them. Verse 17, the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of how many troubles? So raise your hand if as of this date, God has delivered you out of every trouble so far to date. Now, there may be a couple lingering ones he's still working on. But so far, everything in life, you're still here. You're still around. You didn't think you were going to make it, but you made it. Okay? And God did it pretty good. 
So the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Brokenness before God is what gets God's attention. Tears. Hey, guys, it's okay to shed tears every now and then. You don't have to do it in front of everybody. Probably, that's probably the best, but it's okay to let the tears flow every now and then. And let your heart be known to God. God knows you're trying to hold it in and you're not doing a very good job of it. Amen? The Lord is nigh unto them that have a broken heart and save such to be a contrite spirit. Many, many, underline this in your Bible, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Don't give me this garbage about how if you just name it right, you can name all of your problems and speak all your problems away and you're going to live happily ever after until the Lord comes. It's a lie. And I, my, my idea of why the devil will use that particular lie is it's a setup. If, if, he, can, if he can have people convince you that if you do everything right with God, then you get all these super blessings and you, all your problems are gone and you have money and you're going to have health and you're going to have everything going your way and everything defeated around you and you're just going to walk in victory 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If enough people can convince enough people of that, the devil knows that when he pulls the rug out from underneath them, they're going to come down crashing hard and when they're told that it was something that they did wrong and that it's their own fault, nine times out of ten, they're going to say, I give up, I can't do it. And they'll never darken the door of a church ever again. And that's the kind of stuff that Joyce Myers has spread all over the world. Yes, I'm still her enemy. And she's mine. Because of the sorceries and the whoredoms that come out of her mouth and the teachings and the false gospels and the false hope that she lays on people and that if they don't end up rich and successful and pretty like she is, that was a joke, that's obviously there's something, they're doing something wrong and it's their fault and they just need to do better. And it's a setup. And it's destroyed a lot of people from thinking that that's the way Christianity is, and that's not it. Underline that in your Bible and be ready to pull that out on somebody next time they try this on you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. In Genesis 6, turn there very quickly, it's one verse. In fact, let me show you this, okay? You've I just did the watchman on this about the number five, the patterns of the number five in Genesis five. In Genesis five, everybody's mentioned five times. The fifth time they're mentioned, they died. Adam died. Seth, mentioned five times, he dies. Enos, mentioned five times, he dies. Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared. Um, it skipped Enoch, okay? But then it falls back on Methuselah. Methuselah lives 969 years. The fifth time he's mentioned in Genesis 5, he dies. And then that's passed on to Lamech. Lamech was the father of Noah. Lamech's mentioned in verse, um, uh, let's see here, verse uh, 30. And Lamech lived after he begat Noah 595 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 777 years. If I was going to live to be an age, I would like to live to be 777. I think that's just a cool number. Okay. And he died. But Lamech still died, okay? And you, if you start counting the mentioning of Noah in verse 29, his name is mentioned once there. Verse 30, one, that's the second time. Verse 32, he's mentioned the third and the fourth time. And then you have to go down to verse 8 of the next chapter. The fifth time Noah's name is mentioned, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah ends up escaping temporarily, the curse that was laid upon his predecessors in Genesis chapter 5. And so Noah understood that he's got a date with death one of these days. And Noah, from what we know after the flood, 
Noah likes to plant vineyards and drink wine and get drunk. So did Noah need grace? Yep. Before there was an ark, before one animal showed up, before one raindrop fell, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And again, you can always tell when you look in somebody's eyes whether they're for you or against you. And Noah knew that if he looked into the eyes of the Lord, he knew what he would find. He'd find grace. Do you think the prodigal son, do you think he, in the back of his mind, believed that his father would take him back as a son and not a servant? I think so. It doesn't say it. I can't prove it. But you try to put yourself in somebody's position and think about it, and he, he just came to himself one day, and he realized, my dad's slaves have it better than I have right now. And I think, at least hoping, as he's making that journey back home to his daddy's house, I think in the back of his mind, he's hoping that dad would take him back, but it would be too much to ask. And he didn't have to. Dad just gave it to him. Amen? Just gave it to him.